Thanks for joining our YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, please click that subscribe button to join our community. That way you can get updated on each week's messages. With that being said, we pray that this message encourages and inspires you to take one step closer to Jesus. How are you doing? What is up? We do want to celebrate Martin Luther King weekend uh, this weekend and, uh, and celebrate the great man of God who was a great reformer in his time and a uh, uh, beautiful thing. If you're new to our church, by the way, my name is Brent. I get the privilege of being your lead pastor and uh, we're going to continue to experience God together over the next few moments. I always want to celebrate as we get started. Um, so much to celebrate, but uh, just this last weekend on, uh, I think it started Thursday night, Friday night, and then on Saturday there was a deliverance conference that went on here called Release to Soar. I think there were 32 people uh, that went through that and found freedom. Isn't that awesome? My wife was telling me about it last night, and as she was talking, I was thinking in my head how oftentimes we sing about freedom, we talk about freedom, but we don't actually live in freedom. Freedom is something that has to be walked out. It's something that, that actually starts at one level of freedom, and you'll find that you get more free as you walk it out. It's not like you, you suddenly are totally free from sin. And uh, uh, freedom is a beautiful thing, and sometimes you need to walk it out. So when these Release to Soar events come, come out, uh, a few times a year we usually do these. Make sure that you jump in and be uh, a part of those. Also just want to quickly share this. Wednesday night Bible study for adults is back on up in the upper room while youth is going on in here. Just want to quickly remind you of that and tell you uh, last week, uh, I got to share my story of my heart attack, and I think it was uh, beneficial for some people. But this week, an even better story is going to come up because Pastor Tina wanted to share her story of her near-death experience this year. Hers is way better than mine. Um, and so if you are an adult and you want to hear that story, it's Wednesday night at 7. It's going to be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, with all that being said, uh, we do need to have one uh, quick announcement for our church family. Josh and Kat, can you guys make your way on up? I should say Pastor Josh and Kat. And, uh, and I'll let you guys make this announcement to the church. Hey, I got music, walk-up music. This is like WWE. That's my theme song. So listen, I don't have a near-death experience to share. Uh, I'm not cool like Pastor Brandon and Pastor Tina. Maybe one day I'll have one, but I'm not going to ask for that. I can use the ministry days. You have many near-death experiences. I saw a few of them. <laughs> this is true. So listen, um, this series, Stars and Galaxies, is really, really interesting. It's amazing because... Uh, I know there's scientific understanding behind it, but when a star is formed and everything comes together, at least from my eye, it makes no sense. You got gas exploding against gas, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know the science behind it. Maybe I should have read up on it, but on my terms, it doesn't make sense. And uh, my story doesn't make sense sometimes. Um, there's a lot of times when you are following the will of God, it doesn't make sense. There's a lot of times we pray and say, hey, God, let this make sense. Let there be peace. You can be in the will of God and not have peace about it because sometimes he calls you to extreme and crazy things. And I remember years and years and years ago, I was sharing with the kids this past week. I was sharing there was a season in my life when I was 11 or 12 years old. My dad's job of 20 years closed down and we were living on like $50 a week. As a kid, I didn't understand that, but I remember going to special places and getting groceries and going here and there, and none of it made sense. And then we come down to Florida, we go on vacation, and while we're on vacation, this random lady offers to buy my parents' home, my mom gets this random job, and all this. And I never went back to pack. I've been on permanent vacation for a very long time in Florida. And in that moment, it didn't make sense. But then I fast forward 15, 20 years later, and I become kids pastor at this church in Mulberry. A few years later, I get a phone call from this crazy guy that you guys know as Pastor Brent Sipson. And he calls me and says, hey, we're looking for a kids pastor. And I see how all those crazy things beforehand suddenly make sense. And a few months ago, I got a phone call that in my head didn't make sense. And just to share with you guys, our time at Arise is wrapping up. Uh, we are, our last Sunday is February 13th. And so we're going to celebrate some things with you. Um, but this phone call in the moment didn't make sense um, to go where we're going. I'm not going to, if you guys want to talk personally, I'll share it. But I'm not going to share it um, just because they haven't shared it with the kids of their church uh, to be kids pastor there. So I want to honor that in case anybody's watching online. Um, but I would love to share it with you privately. But this call didn't make sense for me. It didn't make sense because 
I have worked with this gentleman even before my time at Arise and with Pastor Ada and their family. And so it's a, it's a, a new season. For you guys that have been risers for a long time, it's an interrobang season. It's a question mark and an explanation point because we are excited and thrilled, but in the same breath, um, there's a little bit of mourning that's taking place because we love this place. This place is home. This place is family. And so we're going to walk through it uh, together in this exciting time. And so now I'm in a season. It doesn't make sense, but I know I'm following the will of God. And just to share one last thing, a lot of people are curious to why. Um, I want you to know that this man is an amazing leader. Uh, this church is an amazing church where people experience God. There's nothing behind the scenes where I'm like, I'm tired of this guy. And not even <laughs> close to it. Not even close to it. Um, but as many of you know, I have been blessed with me and my wife. And I brought Jude on stage to get brownie points so you guys aren't mad at me. But uh, I've been blessed to be able to go to a lot of camps recently. And let me tell you, how they do camp in Kansas and Iowa looks very, very different than how they do camp here in Florida. And as I have just began to experience different cultures, for the last seven and a half years, I have worn this Batman utility belt that has one style of church and one style of leadership and one style of communication. And I just feel like God is calling us another direction to continue to build that utility belt as I continue to be blessed to share the gospel message with kids across the world. And so with that said, we're gonna be going back here in a few minutes to share it with many of your children. Um, I encourage you parents to allow this to be a positive thing in their life, to paint this as an amazing picture. We're going to talk with them, but I encourage you to have a conversation with them in the car. As for some of them, this could be a, a hard time. I remember as a kid when youth pastors transitioned, when this guy left as youth pastor, I was so mad at him. I was like, he don't care about us. But now that I'm in a position, I understand the world works and God works in seasons. And so... From the bottom of my heart, we love you guys. I hope to get to connect with so many of you guys over the next few weeks. Uh, this place will always be home, uh, and you guys will always be family. So we love you guys. Amen. Love these guys so much. This is a, a difficult transition, not because we're losing an amazing kids pastor, but because we're losing family. And so I just want to be real with you and say, I know for many of you, if you've been at our church for a long time, this is painful because we just love Pastor Josh and Kat so much. And, and, uh, and I am, I'm the head of the way for that. We did want to announce it very early. It's not till February 13th. It's his last Sunday. We will do a kind of special party kind of thing for them on the Wednesday before that on the 9th. Um, but we did want to announce it early so that you had plenty of time to, um, to grieve. <laughs> if you've been around for a long time, you know what I'm talking about because Josh is so key to everything here. But to grieve and be able to love on him and be able to talk to him and, and uh, just be, be able to say your goodbyes. And so uh, everybody understand that? All right. Last week we did the State of the Church Address. Anybody enjoy that? Yes, sir. Awesome. Our theme for this new year is creating stars. We're gonna, we're gonna create galaxies by cultivating stars. And we want you to understand that you are a star and we don't wanna be a church where any leader is ever a star. We want you to be the star of the show. We want people to say, these people are, Arise are amazing, not that pastor at Arise is amazing. Are you with me? Right. 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 We wanna create a galaxy, not a star. When you create a star, you end up with a cult. It always ends up negative towards the church. We wanna create a galaxy of stars. And so that's kind of been our theme. And today as we carry on with that theme, and we're going to have that theme all year, but specifically this month in a sermon series, I want to talk about the birth of a star. Somebody say the birth of a star. Uh, Pastor Josh was sort of correct in some of his assessment of how a star is created. Um, but in order for a star to be created, you need three things. You need hydrogen, this material, this gas. You need uh, gravity to pull it together, and you need time. If you give those three things long enough times, you start to create the formation of a star. Stars are still being formed in galaxies far, far away, all you Star Wars fans. And so you just need those three things. You need a material thing, an immaterial thing, and time, right? Uh, uh, and, and when we look at stars and how they're formed, it's a, it's a violent process. Because what happens is this hydrogen wants to go out. It wants to expand. Gravity is trying to pull it back together. And you end up in this, this violent process and this, this, this cosmic fight of hydrogen trying to be released out here and gravity trying to pull it back together. And the more it pulls it together, the tighter it gets and the tighter it gets, the hotter that it gets. And then you end up with a picture of a star. 
Now, I believe as I was pondering this, there are some very strong connections to the formation of a star and the formation of a Christian star or a follower of Jesus, a formation of you being a star. Because in, a, in, in similar fashion, we have this, this material of our body that naturally wants this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing. And we're all over the place all over the time, all the time. Are, are you with me? Right. And you have this invisible force, and I know the Holy Spirit's not a force, and I'll get to that in a moment, but, but you have this invisible product, this invisible force called the Holy Spirit, who's trying to take all these ideas, all these thoughts, all these desires, and hone them into something differently. And it's a violent, violent battle, y'all. Don't know if you realize how violent, violent it is. If you fought the war with your flesh, you know it's violent. In fact, a tax collector turned follower of Jesus would quote Jesus in the first gospel called Matthew. And he would say this, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Y'all help me out. The violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven within yourself is suffering this violent argument, this, this, this thing inside of you that your will wants one thing, the kingdom of God wants something else, the Holy Spirit wants something else. And if you have ever fought that battle, <clears throat> if you haven't fought that battle, you might need to become a Christian this morning. But if you have ever fought that battle, you know that there's a battle that wages inside of you. Paul would say, the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the good that I, or the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Why? There's this, there's this war that's facing inside of you. And it's probably slightly different for every one of you. And, and the more you submit your will to God's will or to the Holy Spirit, this, this gravitational force that's trying to pull the star together, the more you submit to the Holy Spirit, the more you shine. Right. Okay? The more the star is formed within you. And if you do it long enough, you can start to be honed like a laser. But this is how most of us live, right? If this water represents the energy of our life, the things we spend time on, our, our capacity, we walk around like this and we spray here and there, right? So I have all this energy, but what do I use it on? I use it on Netflix, something that doesn't really matter. Amazon Prime, Hulu, whatever it is for you, something that doesn't really matter and it's just gone. And all of a sudden I had a certain amount of hours in a day, I had a certain amount of energy in my life and I just used it on something that didn't matter. Are you with me? And so we walk out through life and, 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 and I love the bucks, but ultimately they don't matter. And if I live my life for the bucks, it's just fleeting and it's gone. Uh, I live my life for, for a kid's baseball game and, and I love baseball and I love taking your kids to baseball games, but if it starts dominating your life, all of a sudden things that don't matter ultimately are taking all your energy. Uh, it, it's all over the place. I wrote down a few of them. It could be, it could be social media. <laughs> and all of a sudden you find yourself staring at your cell phone or your tablet way too long and you get done and you think, I just wasted all of this time. And, and what happens is our minds become a little bit ADD Anybody with me on that? Right. Squirrel, right? Our minds become a little bit ADD. And so you walk through life and there's this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing. Ultimately, none of them actually make you a better person or cause you to come closer to Christ. All of a sudden you're going through life and your attention gets drawn to politics and it's all awesome, but it doesn't actually affect your life. And your attention gets drawn over to pornography and it starts to invade your mind. And it's this fleeting thing that's like there in a moment and then it's gone. Are, are you with me? Yeah. Are, are you with me? It could, it could be all kinds of things. It could be good things like, like, like work. It's not that work is wrong, but it starts to dominate your life. And when you die, they won't miss you that much. That's why. Are you with me? <laughs> but what the Holy Spirit does, it's like the formation of the star. It's like gravity. What the Holy Spirit does is takes all this water and he's trying to bring it all together. He takes all this energy and he's trying to... I'm not trying to be a spoiler alert, but there's a part in Spider-Man. <laughs> the last one where Dr. Strange is trying to take all this and he's trying to keep it together and he's going like this and he's trying to pull it all together. Again, I'm not trying to spoil anything. That's the image I get for what the Holy Spirit does in our life. He's saying all this energy, I need to collapse it all together. All of it is good, but let's collapse it together and actually turn it into a singular, singular focus. And then all of a sudden, you, you got to get a little bit closer to God and closer to God. And before you know it, you end up with a singular focus that's laser-like. You do realize that's what happened in Genesis chapter 1. Sorry, I don't mean to get so far away from the mic. That's what happens in Genesis chapter 1. The Holy Spirit is the one that takes disorder and chaos and turns it into order. Right. Come on. 
The Holy Spirit is the one who's trying to take all of these different thoughts and these emotions going on inside of you. All of these different uh, swirl, bird, whatever, all these different things that we live in, in our lives are like all over the place. And he's trying to bring it together into a singular focus that actually chases Jesus rather than become distracted by the world. Are you with me? I should walk around. I'd mess up with the camera people and just spray everybody. But Because our... our, our our energy gets divided and then it dissipates into empty arenas and things that don't matter and that aren't remembered. So let me ask you this question. Where is the energy of your life going? Are you being pulled? Is your life being pulled in every direction or is it aimed by the Holy Spirit's calling on your life? Right. Hmm. <laughs> Am I speaking to anybody in this room? Yes, sir. Because my life is getting pulled in every direction. And the Holy Spirit is the one going, all right, not that all those directions are necessarily bad, but he's trying to hone it in. Out of the chaos, he's trying to provide order. He's trying to focus us. It's just like a start of a star, the formation of a star. I often feel this whenever I'm preaching because what happens is when you find your calling, your calling will very much feel like what I'm talking about. It's a violent thing. It's a difficult thing. <coughs> And when I'm writing a sermon, can I, can, I, can I just share the behind the scenes of what happens? Yeah. Uh, it happens a few other things that I do as well. But when I'm writing a sermon, there's this, there's this energy that comes over me. I have these thoughts over here and over here and over here in Bible passages I've studied and in and, and scripture things I've studied and in languages I've studied and philosophy and all these different patterns. And they're all over the place, man. If you were ever in my mind <laughs> during sermon prep and I'm trying to take all of that and turn it into this, 45 minutes, trying to turn it into this. So I got all these thoughts, every sermon I've ever, I've heard thousands of sermons over, I might've heard hundreds of thousands of sermons over the course of my, all these thoughts that are all, and I'm trying to take all these thoughts and pull it in together. And it's a weird feeling that there's an energy about it. There, there's something about it that like inside of you, like, like there, there, there's this awkward energy. Jeremiah would say, it's like fire shut up in my bones. There's this awkward energy about it. And, and, and it's kind of, you get a little edgy. You get a little frustrated. You're a little bit nervous. And, and, and inside of you, there's all these different feelings going on all at the same time. And you're a little bit hyper and you're a little bit excited and there's a weightiness to it and you're uncomfortable and there's like this inner fire and all of this is going, let me tell you what happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, I got to leave my desk and go for a walk. Yeah. Are you with me, Pastor Kieran? There's some, like, like, there's only so much I can handle at a time. I'm just being real with you. And, and I gotta, I gotta, all right, I gotta go take a walk. Because I, anybody ever take a pre-workout drink? Yes, sir. Back in the day, they used to sell this stuff called Jack 3D. They took it off the market because I think it was killing everybody. <laughs> man, I remember taking workout drinks back in the day. That's probably why I had a heart attack. I haven't done it in years now. But, man, I would take workout drinks, and it's like inside of your very like everything inside of you is tingly, like in the inside. You're just like, ooh, 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 ooh. I got to go do something. I got to, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of what it feels like when I'm writing a sermon. Now that's an unnatural one, but this is the Holy Spirit taking all of this and it's a violent process. And here's the truth. It is uncomfortable. I wish I could tell you that I sit down and the Holy Spirit comes on me and it's beautiful. And I sense his peace all over me and I sense his spirit on me and I just put my pen to paper and it's like my hand just starts moving. I'm, I'm writing in tongues at that point and, and my hand just starts moving and I look down and I'm like, oh, that's profound. Look what God just gave me. I wish I could tell you that it was like that, but it's not. Right. Writing sermons is a violent process. It's a process of taking all of the knowledge that I've ever learned and honing it into something that's specific and timely and just for our church each week. Are, are you with me? Right. Yeah. Come on. That, that's what it'll feel like whenever you find your calling. That's great. Whatever your calling is, there's something about your calling that is going to feel a little, a little uneasy, a little bit edgy. You're excited at the same time that you're inquisitive. And, 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 and you got all these different thoughts and they're all collabing together. And the Holy Spirit is trying to focus you like a laser in that moment to be his instrument. There's something about it that's uncomfortable. Has anybody ever sensed that before? See, the Holy Spirit, like gravity, is drawing you to a place of this inner fire. 
It's your calling. <coughs> While your flesh is always trying to evaporate or displace that inner thing into empty voids. All that energy that God has given you, all those thoughts, all those ideas, all those passions, your flesh is trying to displace it all over the place. The Holy Spirit's trying to pull it into one central focused thought. And that's an awkward place. It's good, but make no mistake, it's uncomfortable. When this happens, you found your calling. When this happens, you found your calling. This is why when I teach, because my gift, my calling is teaching, oftentimes apostolic. So, so when I teach specifically with other pastors or when I teach specifically from the pulpit or write sermons, when I teach, there's something inside of me. I can't go to sleep afterwards. Like, like some people like preach at night and they go to bed. Like I'll be up till 3 a.m. after I preach. There's something inside. You're just so like, ah! <laughs> have, have you found that yet? Because when you find that, you just found your calling. Come on. Wow. Yeah. Whatever it is. The Holy Spirit is not an energy, but yet he will feel energetic to you. Right, and when he comes on you, you'll feel it that way. So if you're taking notes, that was a long introduction. And again, these are random thoughts coming through my head as the Holy Spirit has directed through this series. And especially today, it's different than a normal message. I'm not just taking one passage and expounding on it. But there is a violent thing that happens. And a, a life surrendered to the Holy Spirit becomes a star. A life surrendered to the Holy Spirit becomes a star. All of a sudden, all of these, these, these placements get pulled together for one central thing, and it's the place of following Jesus. That's what regeneration is. That's what salvation is. See, when you surrender your gifts, your abilities, your strengths, your weaknesses to the Holy Spirit, he takes what you give him. Like a million stories throughout the Bible, he takes the little bit that you give him and turns it into something great. He turns it into something beautiful to your life. He will take your meekness and make you the greatest lover of people that, that's ever existed. He will take your boldness and make you into the greatest evangelist. Oftentimes we think God takes you and turns you into something else. I don't think that's true. I think what actually happens most of the time, and God can do whatever he wants, he's God, but I think most of the time God takes the characteristics that you already have that are all over the place, hones them in, and actually makes them greater because you surrender them to him. Right. And that's what begins to happen. And the secret to all of this new life is surrender. I feel like I say this every week in one way or another, and you've heard it so many times, but it's so true. The doorway, the entrance to the kingdom of God is surrender. In every part of your life, it's surrender. But here's the thing, surrender is uncomfortable. It's awkward, it's difficult. Surrender is hard to do when you wanna hold on to something. But when you surrender, God takes all that random material and pulls it together to make something beautiful out. It's not a one-time thing. That's probably why I talk about it all the time. If it was a one-time thing, that'd be easy. Get saved, you surrender your life to Christ, then we all sing, I surrender all. But it's not a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. Sometimes it's an hourly thing. Sometimes it's a moment by moment thing. Sometimes it's a spontaneous thing in the moment that God is teaching you. Was it Sunday before last? I, I um sitting there watching the Bucks game and Antonio Brown has his meltdown and all that. And I'm laughing and I'm having all these thoughts. And, and y'all know I can be pretty snarky if that's the right word. Pastor Tina would use that word. I can be pretty snarky and I made like a snarky Facebook post about it. Literally like I hit send, it's on, it's on, it's on Facebook. And immediately the Holy Spirit's like, no, I wouldn't say that about it. Therefore, you don't get the right to say it about it. Oh, yeah. I said, all right, do I want the applause of people to go, ha, ah, that's really funny. Or do I want the applause of heaven? Come on. Yeah. So within 60 seconds or something, I went back on there and I took it right back down and I, probably nobody ever saw it. My, my point is, surrender is not just with the big things, it's with right. the small things. Yeah. Yeah, so true. And will you submit yourself over to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, or are we going to do our own will? See, the worker of the creation of the star is the Holy Spirit. He is the gravity that holds it all together. Listen to Colossians 1.17. We use this verse a lot in, inside of apologetics. It says, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. You know what you call it? Physics. But you know who it is? The Holy Spirit. From the beginning of time, from the very first verses of Genesis, it is chaos and he brings it into order. And to this moment, he is still holding it in order. Order. If the Holy Spirit's not there, everything will go to disorder. Right. 
To the level of your surrender to the Holy Spirit will be the level of your surrender to order in your life. Wow. See, the Holy Spirit is not an it. I know we talk about gravity and I'm using this analogy, but he's not an it. He's a person of the Godhead. He is God. He is the very spirit of God that hovered over the waters in the very beginning. He loves you. He's sometimes referred to as the spirit of Jesus. He is not just an it. He wants to have a personal relationship with you and empower you. See, the Holy Spirit empowered the miracles of the Old Testament. He was the empowerment of Moses. He was the empowerment of Elijah and Elisha. He was the empowerment of an Abraham. He was the one who gave Abraham faith in the beginning. He is the one who empowered the Old Testament. He empowered the New Testament. He was the very empowerment of Jesus as Jesus in his human form was surrendered over to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden you see this total surrender picture and all of a sudden he can do anything that the Holy Spirit wants to do through him. He's the empowerment of the New Testament church, the disciples, the apostles. He's the empowerment there. And he's still the empowerment to this day. He empowers you. He empowers me. And if you want to be a star for Jesus, what we have to do is submit ourselves, surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit who takes all of those plethora of emotions and thoughts and scattered mind and brings it together so that we don't have a divided mind. We have a unified mind. We don't have a divided spirit. We have a unified spirit. Are y'all with me? You surrender it to him. So what do you call it when when surrendered people come together? What do you call it when he focuses all that material that's going on inside of you and you get a group of people? You know, you call a pack of wolves, you call them a pack. When you have a bunch of school, (laughs) when you have a bunch of fish, you call it a school. When you have a bunch of dolphins, you call it a pod. You have a bunch of buffalo, you call it a herd. A bunch of lions, you call it a pride. A bunch of bats, you call it a colony. Uh, If you have a bunch of elk, you call it a gang. If you have a bunch of ferrets, you call it business. I find that funny. (laughs) If you have a bunch of gorillas, they call them a band. If you have a bunch of monkeys, they call it a troop. All of a sudden, troops in Boy Scouts make a lot more sense. A bunch of monkeys are called a troop. If you have a group of rhinoceroses, they call it a crash. If you have a group of tigers, they call it an ambush. (laughs) That's fitting. (laughs) What do you call a group of people that are surrendered to the Holy Spirit? Huh. Huh. A group of lives, people, stars, so to speak, surrender to the Holy Spirit becomes a church. When the people who are focused and have now surrendered themselves to the Holy Spirit come together, it's not a gang, it's not a colony, it's not just a family, it's actually what the church is. I wrote this, and even as I wrote it this week, I thought, wow, that's good. (laughs) When a temple assembles a group of devotees, it's called a religion. When a religious star assembles a group of their devotees, it's called a cult. But when the Holy Spirit assembles a group of surrendered Christ followers, it's called a church. I've I've been struck by this thought for a long time. And if you've gone through discovery class or next steps experience now, we're calling it. If you've gone through that, you've probably heard me mention this before. but, 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 But I've been struck by Acts 2 for quite a while. That the only difference between Acts 2 and Acts 1 is the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts 2, 1 through 4. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Violent. Notice that word again. We all want the Holy Spirit to be a dove, but sometimes the Holy Spirit is violent, and the kingdom of God is violent. Came like a violent wind from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Here's what I want you to see. The church of Acts 1, or the assembling of saints in Acts 1 and prior, going all the way back in the book of, in the book of John and, and all the way back, the, the, the group of assembling of people in Acts 1 did everything that they did in Acts 2. They, they were assembling together. They were praying. They were studying the Bible together or essentially preaching or teaching uh, the Old Testament together. They were feeding the poor. They, they were doing virtually everything that they were doing in Acts 2. Yet Acts 2 is universally known as the birthplace of the church. It doesn't matter what, what, what uh, background you come from, Catholic, Methodist, whatever. Whatever, we all agree in Christendom that Acts 2 starts the church. That's the birthplace of the church. Here's the thing. Acts 1 and Acts 2, the only difference is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> they were doing all kinds of good things in Acts 1. 
godly things, things that we still do to this day, they were doing in Acts 1. But until the Holy Spirit showed up, they were not at church yet. We got to be so careful, church, in America, across the world today, and in America especially, that we don't get so full of good things that we replace the Holy Spirit. He is what makes the church. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one that gathers the stars. Because once the star is formed, then the galaxy can be formed. And the galaxy is formed by, formed by that same gravitational force that then takes the stars and pulls them together in a violent process, drawing them together to form a galaxy. You are stars for Christ. And if you've been at churches very long, especially some churches, ours might be a little healthier sometimes, but it is a violent process to come together. I don't like her. I don't like him. There are some people that are good people that I just don't like them. Am I allowed to say that? Can you say that? It's just the truth. And the Holy Spirit will draw us together, not because we like somebody, but because he's unifying us because he's giving us an individual focus. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, what used to be, what used to be, what used to be black, white, background, Catholic, background, Pentecostal, what, what, what used to be have money, don't have money, the Holy Spirit starts unifying and brings the church together so that once again, so that once again, he can bring something beautiful through you, through us. Are, are you with me? See, the Holy Spirit is everything to the church. He is the force that holds the galaxies of stars together. Are y'all getting this? Yeah. I know this is weird for some of us, but he's everything to the church. He's everything to us. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be nothing. If you had, if you had hundreds of millions of dollars, if you had Tom Brady money and you didn't have the Holy Spirit, I promise you, you would not be satisfied. If you had everything that they sell at Bass Pro Shop, come on, gentlemen. If you had all of the diamonds from, from some diamond source store, if you had all of that, but you didn't have the Holy Spirit, I promise you there would be an emptiness inside of you. Right. Why? Because the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. Right. And if you have him, you have all you will ever need. Amen. If you don't have him, you will always be lacking. Come on. Listen, we're going to have an altar call in a few minutes at, at the close. And if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray with you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit on your life. Because I believe he is that important. He's the one that draws us together. And he's the one that holds us together. It's not good preaching. It's not the Bible. It's not the friendliness of the church. It's not good small groups. It's the Holy Spirit that holds us together. When I was a kid, we would sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. Y'all remember that? It's not this building that holds us together. It's not Pastor Brent that holds us together. It's not the friendliness, the small groups. It's not the great kids ministry. It's the Holy Spirit that holds us together. And when we get it in our minds that I'm coming to church because they have kids ministry, or I'm coming to church because the preacher preaches well, or whatever that we get in our minds, we start to lose, lose something that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives and through our lives. Is this, is this too deep for some of us? Are y'all with me? Hmm. He's everything to the church. Why was this God's plan? Why, why did God want galaxies and not just stars? Why didn't God just put stars everywhere and instead want to create a galaxy and draw it together? It's because galaxies can do greater things than stars. <clears throat> stars are beautiful, but galaxies actually are what form the solar system that we look up at night and see the stars. It's not an isolated star here or there. It's a galaxy of stars that light the night. And a star is brilliant, but a galaxy is incredible. A Christian is brilliant, but a church is incredible. See, you are a star and together we are a galaxy. And there's something that's incredibly beautiful from it. Uh, just, 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 just the constellations that form inside of galaxies and, and, and seeing what all God has done inside of galaxies. Ada could tell you she's probably the only person I've ever told this to, but years ago, I, I was in a time with the Lord and God gave me a vision. I was praying and God gave me this vision of a rise and, and, and I saw the state of Florida and, and kind of the South and I saw these lights like stars, like, like all over the place. They were like all over and I, and I saw all these stars and, and God began to speak to me that, that that's a rise. And at the time I thought, I thought, oh, is that campuses of a rise? Cause that's kind of a lot. Like I, you know, that, that, all right, God, if that's what you want to do, but 
I mean, they were like hundreds. Like they, they were all over the South. All these, all these, they were actually down in the Caribbean too, by the way. And they were all, they were the lights that were coming. I'm like, what is that? What is that? And I, I just thought they were campuses. Fast forward all these years and I'm starting to realize you are the star of the church and we make a constellation together and it's beautiful. It's awesome. All of a sudden stars were point people. The stars that remain constant. We've all seen shooting stars. We love to watch shooting stars, but then they're gone in a moment. The church is full of shooting stars. Come on. They get hyped for a moment. Six months later, they're nowhere to be found. But the stars that actually make constellations, the stars that become North stars, the ones that can guide a ship across an entire ocean, the stars that will lead you and guide you through life, those are the ones who are constant. You have any stars in your life? Stars in your family? Grandpa, aunt so-and-so? They were just constant in your life. They were the ones you could turn to. You need stars who are constant that can help you navigate through life. I look around our church. Tony Parker's a star. Shelly Parker's a star. Jose and Esther Matute are stars. Lori Skipper's a star. You look around at people that are just constant. And when you don't know where to turn, you can kind of be like, hey, can you help me? Because they help guide you. They help direct you and they form a galaxy of stars. And you need these constants, not constantly up and down, but constant for Jesus Christ. See, when a galaxy surrenders to the Holy Spirit, when we allow ourselves to surrender to the Holy Spirit, we will do greater things. We will do greater things. John 14, 12, one of the crazy things Jesus said, He said, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. Because, and that's the key word right there, because. Because I am going to the Father. Verse 16 and 17, if you skip down a few, says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. That key word right there is because. You will do greater things, why? Because I'm leaving. Well, that's weird because I thought it was a lot better if you were here. (laughs) Because I'm leaving, I'm going to send an advocate, the spirit of truth he's referred to here. I'm going to spend the very Holy Spirit. I'm going to send him and you'll do greater things because of him. Why? Because he's the one taking all those thoughts and honing it into one story, into one use, taking chaos and putting it into order. I'm going to tell you one story and then we're going to, close. <clears throat> Anybody ever been to St. Augustine? Okay. Hopefully all of us in this room, great little place to visit, lots of cool history. But if you go back even further, do you know who St. Augustine was? Also referred to more appropriately as Augustine, St. Augustine, Augustine. He was born in 354 in North Africa to very disunified parents. His mother was a Christian. His father was a devout pagan. And so he's born in this mixture of a home. And from the earliest years, he was incredibly intelligent. Off the charts IQ, just incredibly smart and and was drawn into philosophy from an early age that, that thought, I wanna be a philosopher. And so as a young man, as soon as he was old enough, he went to Rome because Rome is the capital of philosophy. And if you want to be a great philosopher, where do you go? You go to Rome, obviously. So he goes to Rome and he starts to study under the great philosophers. And it's there and even a little bit prior that he really starts to get into a very sinful lifestyle. Even before he got to Rome, he had a child with a woman, but refused to marry her or take care of her in any way because he said that would tie me down and I'm to be this great philosopher and I'm not having anything to do with you. And so while he would visit from time to time, he didn't want anything to do with that woman or the child. So in Rome, he starts to to, to go up the the world of philosophy. And it's in that same time that he gets into immorality to a decadent degree that would have been across Rome at that time. He becomes hideous in his own words. All kinds of sexual deviations, all kinds of deviations of all types that were going on in Rome, he jumped right into all of them. At 30 years old, he's an up and coming philosopher. He's a genius of a man. And at 30, 30 years old, he gets his, his, his first uh, 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 place to be sent and he's hired 
into the superior court of Milan. It's in Italy, in Milan, Italy, to be their professor of rhetoric. This was his place that he would retire. He would be there until he was done. That was the thought process. That was his plan. And so he takes this abrupt change, leaves Rome, and goes down to Milan to teach rhetoric and become the great philosopher that he knew he was called to become. At that time period, he becomes even more critical of all religious faith as he starts to study all religions. And so he becomes more and more critical of all of them. That also leads to an even more decadent lifestyle in Milan than he ever had when he was in Rome. Now he's making money, he has a type of prestige, and now all of a sudden he's living even worse than he ever was before. Some of you are like, why did we name St. Augustine after this guy? It's during this time his mother had come with him And it's during this time while he's in Milan that his mother arranges a marriage to a great young lady of royal background. And it is a a, a really great moment for him because now he can actually step into uh, royalty and he actually can elevate his place in society besides just being a great philosopher. So he has everything at this point. He's got dreams. He's got brains, he's got money, he's got nobility. He has all of it awaiting in front of him. And so now he's going to be part of the royal court because he's marrying into it, it's beautiful. But he has to wait two years to marry the girl because she's not at marrying age yet. So he has to wait two years to marry the girl. The thing that happens now is that as he's preparing to marry her and be in the royal court, in order to be in the royal court, you have to attend church. It's required at that time period. And the preacher in the church, you may have never heard of, You should have, but you may have never heard of him. His name was Bishop Ambrose. Bishop Ambrose to this day is known as one of the greatest preachers in the history of the church. And Bishop Ambrose would come in and preach week after week. And Augustine would come in and sit week after week, at first being very skeptical, but then being drawn into these teachings. And what did he do? He did what you and I often do whenever we're drawn into these teachings. He thought, I need to live a better lifestyle, stop sinning so much, so I'm gonna figure out how to do it. So he used all of his philosophy and said, how do I stop sinning? I don't need Christ to help me stop sinning. I can just do it by myself. And he found that he couldn't stop sinning. There was no way that he could actually stop. All of those desires that he knew in himself were wrong, and he loved going to church. The accounts go that the first six days of the week or the, or the other days of the week besides Sunday, the next six days of the week were, were boring to him. It was always a wait to just, when can we get back to church? When can we get to church? And he's not a Christian, but he was so enveloped by this Christian thought, this Christian philosophy. And during that two years while he was waiting on his wife to be at marrying age, He found himself deeply depressed and discouraged because he had tried not to sin by every way possible and it hadn't worked. And so he finds himself in a garden and he's sitting up against a wall, his mind all over the place. Thoughts over here, thoughts over here, thoughts over here, disunified all over his philosophical genius mind. And he's sitting there with his back up against the wall And he hears a kid on the other side of the wall. It's a child on the other side of the wall that says this. The the kids were talking, whatever, and the kid said, take up and read. And it stood out to him when he said that. And he looked over beside him and there was a Bible that had been there from somebody else that was studying and it was sitting there on the chair or the bench beside him sitting next to the wall that he hadn't even noticed. That was his sign from God. And so he picked up the Bible and opened it up at random. And the verse that he read that was right in front of him was Romans 13, 13. It says, let us behave decently and in, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. And he couldn't have found a more perfect passage for him in that moment and what he was dealing with. And he realized in that moment, this crystal realization, this stark realization, in that moment of unifying all these thoughts, pulling it together, that he can't do this by himself. All the philosophy in the world is not going to save him from his sin and set him free from the bondage of his sin. And so it was in that moment that he surrendered his life to Christ. All of Ambrose's sermons had come rushing back to him. He said, I can't do this by myself. And this philosopher that you would have never heard of surrenders his life completely to Christ. Within a week, he decided he was going to become a priest instead of just being a philosopher. 
He broke off his royal engagement that he had, surrendered that over to the Lord, resigned his position there in Milan. He remained celibate until the day that he died and took on responsibility of actually raising the child that he had fathered earlier on in his life. The story goes that his old mistress kept trying to engage their old relationship and she would come up to him over and over and she would say, Augustine, Augustine, it is I. To which he would respond, yes, but it is not I. (laughs) Augustine went on to use all of his intelligence and training in philosophy and theology and lay the foundation for what much of what is our current Christian philosophy and theology and thought today. His teachings would actually lay the groundwork for the Reformation centuries later with Martin Luther. It would change everything. One man who had all of these desires, all of these passions, all of these things, realizing the Holy Spirit needed to bring it together and bring order out of chaos. Has he done that in your life yet? You may not know this, but St. Augustine is quoted with some of the most famous quotes in all of history. For instance, he said, faith is to believe what you do not see. And the reward of this faith is to see what you believe. He said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. He's the one who said, pray as though everything depended on God and work as though everything depended on man. He said, thou hast created us for thyself and our heart is not quiet until we rest in thee. He said, if you believe what you like about the gospels and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. (laughs) These are 1700 year old quotes that are still relevant. I think if you had time to process it, maybe his greatest quote, or at least the one that stands out to me, he said, humility is the foundation of all other virtues. It's in the soul is in the soul in which this virtue does not exist. There cannot be any other virtue except in mere appearance. Y'all can look that one up later and ponder it, it is deep. You have this man who was all over the place, his own lifestyle, his own worldview, his own opinions, all over the place. And all of a sudden, when he surrenders to the Holy Spirit, you would have never heard of Augustine. You would have never known who he was, but he surrenders to the Holy Spirit in a life that's deluded and dissipated with energies all over the place, gets focused by the Holy Spirit and the Lord, and he finds his purpose and his calling. And to this day, he is one of your key people in the history of the church. He's part of your family. He's one of the ones that brought us here today. (laughs) Have you surrendered over to the Holy Spirit? Has he taken your mind that's caught up all over the place, your spirit that's divided all over the place and brought it into focus. It's a violent process. It's not easy. It's awkward. It's hard, but it's worth it. And he will take what you lay in his hands and make it beautiful. Thanks for watching. Wasn't that an amazing message? We ask that you like and subscribe and share it on all your social platforms. We pray that that message left you feeling encouraged and inspired to take that extra step closer to Jesus. We'll see you next week.